we're going to start module six, the swamp inhabitants. Um, and that's a module of um, the workshop, deep time, paleobotany and plant evolution. Yeah, here we have a timeline again, and the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and Cenozoic together. Those eras form the Phanerozoic, um, and that means a uh, time period uh, of uh, yeah, with with life. And of the Paleozoic, we're going to look at the Carboniferous swamps, and that includes the Mississippian and the Pennsylvanian, but mainly the late Pennsylvanian, but I will use mainly use the word Carboniferous. Um, during the Carboniferous, our planet was in a um, in a ice age um, um, time interval. We call that the late Paleozoic ice age, and that is one of the few time intervals um, of the only time longer time interval. That is comparable more or less with the situation that we're in right now. We're in a ice house world now as well. There are ice sheets on our poles. It was that was the case at that time as well. And it was uh, global cooling um, that caused the Euro American tropics to become ever wet during those glacial intervals during the Carboniferous. So during that time, Ever wet swamps dominated the Euro American lowlands. So, in Europe and America, in both spaces, but also in China, that was also um, lying, some parts of China that were at that time also located in the tropics, you could find these ever wet swamps. Um, tall lycopod trees grew in the wettest areas on the landscapes, and um, they started out as, as Poles going up and up and up and up. And when it was time to reproduce, they often split in different in different ways. And different lycopods have different canopies. Some of them um, are very divided and some of them not at all. They only split in two before they produce spore cones. Um, so that's why what you're looking at. These were the emergent plants in those in those lycopod swamps. In the slightly drier areas here to the right, small ferns, tree ferns, uh, giant horsetails, small horsetails, seed ferns, and conifer relative chordates were living. So I'm now going to talk you through um, the the most um, uh, dominant inhabitant of those swamps. And I'm going to start with one, the one that I find most, most intriguing, and those are the arborescent lycopods. So what people think is that they began life as, as a, a small embryo germinating from a megaspore, so from a large spore. And that sp spore is that, 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 that small plant started to first um, produce um, roots and started to uh, produce leaves centrally before it started to go up. So the, the yeah, juvenile um, lycopods must have looked relatively weird. So you had a relatively big root system that branched dichotomously and this one pole going up with um, leaves with one single vein on the trunk. And those leaves were um, growing in a, a, a helical uh, arrangement. So um, this went on for quite a bit. Some of the plants were probably up to um, yeah, 35 meters, so, so almost 100 feet tall. And eventually, um, when it was getting ready to reproduce the top part of the tree in this case one with a lot of branches started to also um, branch dichotomously so split in two split in two split in two split in two and then when it was done um at the tips a relatively big spore cones were formed and here it says lepidostrobus this whole thing is called lepidodendron but because 
similar parts of the plants can be found on other uh, different trees and before because some of the plant parts were described independently before somebody figured out they all belong together they all have different names so the large lycopods almost all have a root system that is that is similar with these um, big uh, lobes that we call stigmaria then from the bottom, when it's an old stem, the old stem will look different because the leaves already dropped higher up the stems. You will see the, the surface uh, with leaf scars. And if you go even higher up, you will see branches with still leaves on them. And then also the cones are described separately. This one is called Lepidostrobus. So everything more or less start with Lepido. Lepidofloius means leaf from a lepidodendron. So here to the right, um, you can see that the, the trunk of the plant, it has a very thick bark uh, or cortex layer and only very little wood. So this is the orange indicates primary wood that you would expect in every vascular bundle, but it also produces secondary wood and that means it's real wood. But that is not what keep, was keeping this, this trunk upright. It was really um, a lot of bark. So it's a bark tree. And if you find fossils of them, very often you see that this, what is green here, rots away fast and that the whole outside collapses. But very often the outside is pretty sturdy as well. So that gets preserved too. Okay, here we have a relatively big fossil of showing uh, one of the top, uh, tops of the trees, one of the, the canopies, and big stems with big leaves coming off and smaller stems with smaller leaves. So the narrower the branches, are the, the smaller the diameter of the branches becomes, the smaller the leaves are. Okay, so those were the, the big lycopods. I'm going to quickly check time. Um, Ferns. I think almost everybody here probably knows what ferns look like. And if you would see one of the most dominant ferns in these Carboniferous swamps, that's Saronius, you would probably not think, oh, this is really extremely special. They have a growth habit that looks a lot like some of the extant tree, tree ferns. They're not... Um, uh, related to the accent tree ferns, they're actually related Saronius. Here you can see a big fossil on, on the left, um, a big stem with, um, well, yeah, with, 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 um, with, with fronts coming off. Um, they're actually um, related to uh, Maratia. So these were actually the earliest Maratielis. Um, those Saronias, they dominated the late Carboniferous swamps. Um, in the later part of the Carboniferous, some of the bigger lycopod lineages already went extinct. Um, and these started to, to take over. Now, if we look at the reconstruction of Saronias, there is something interesting, namely it's relatively wide at the base. And as, as most ferns, for the Saronius started with relatively few leaves in the beginning. And um, it started to, while it got uh, bigger and taller, produce more leaves at the top. So here, if you look at the top, you can see a whole crown with leaves. But you know that when it was small, it could not have that many leaves at the bottom. And we know that this uh, true because we can actually see in cobalt sections through different parts of those stems uh, preserved. They're not the same plant, of course, but they represent uh, the different life stages of them. So if we would have a Saronius, uh, and if we would have a cross section of the base of the tree, you would see um, leaf traces. So this would lead actually into um, higher up into uh, um, yeah, 
a leaf coming off of the trunk, so more or less um, similar to what's happening here. And you can see that there are only one or two of those leaf traces. So this is not a lot of uh, area of the stem. The stem is actually surrounded by, by roots, aerial roots that come down from the leaves from above. And some of those leaves are already gone, but the roots still exist. So every leaf, the base of their leaf, they produce some roots. So the base of this tree um, um, is not the stem itself. It's mainly represented by a gigantic root mantle. If you would go, would go higher up, and you would make a section here through this uh, through this crown, you would see a lot more leaf traces that all lead into these leaves over here. So this is I find this yeah very interesting. But also, if you're looking at gold balls and you make a peel like Tom Phillips did, and you see this, you immediately know what part of the tree fern you're looking at. And if you see something like this, you immediately think, oh, that's Saronius. I'm looking at the root mantle. So that's how we recognize different parts of the plants. And it's very nice to show a reconstruction like this, but it took quite a lot of work to get that far. So here on the left, you would see what would happen if we would be able to look at all the um, cross sections of the steps. So very few leaf traces at the bottom, more and more and more thicker stem on the inside. So you're looking at a kind of inverse cone of um, actual um, stem material surrounded by a big root mantle. So I also mentioned the gigantic horse tails. Well, I, I think most people know, will probably know what a horse tail um, looks like. They're segmented, they make stems, um, they don't have leaves, but those are the ones that are around nowadays. The ones in the past were relatively big and um, they actually did produce leaves. And this is a diagram that shows them with a human standing next to it. And it would be great if we would still have them, but I'm glad that we still have the little ones because imagine not having those. So they had tall trunks, um, probably less than 20 meters tall. All organs, just like the extant horsetails, have distinct nodes and internodes. If you just look at um, the stem, here we have a fossil of what we call a calamite. Calamite represents is, is the, the stem part. You see distinct nodes um, on the stem. That's how they grew, uh, grow, and they have septa in between on the inside. So it's a hollow stem with septa in between. You can also see little tiny dots coming out on the nodes, and those are um, whorls of branches. Um, and this is what one of those branches, fossil branches, looks like. So this is what would be attached to those, those dots on, on the stem. And, and there are definitely leaves attached to them. So here we have the the main branch, a side branch, and also coming out in nice little whorls and kind of linear, um, yeah, linear uh, to, to um, ovate leaves. And they, they almost look like flowers. This is one of, of my yeah, favorite types of fossils. If you see something like an anularia, and it's nicely preserved. There's there are very few things that can actually beat this. They always look beautiful. So just like horse tails nowadays, those gigantic horse tails um, had rhizomes. Uh, that's not really uh, indicated here, but uh, they formed clones. Uh, as well. So could be that connected to this one, another big one was coming out of the ground and another one and another one and another one. And some of the, the current deciduous um, horse tails 
survive during the winter in these uh, underground rhizomes. So we, we have a good idea what their rooting structures look like. And the seed habit, habit, we haven't talked much about that yet, but it evolved in woody plants by the late Devonian. Those fossils are rare, but they are present. So that's really good to know when exactly that happened. And there are still seed plants around. Um, the clades are cycads, the ginkgos, the nidophytes, and the conifers. And all, all of those clades and all the other clades uh, appear during major clades, uh, they appear during the carboniferous. Um, everything except, uh, yeah, uh, the flowering plants. So important in the swamps are the so-called seed ferns. And the seed fern name um, came into existence because people were initially describing certain types of leaves or branch systems as ferns. And then at one point they realized that there were actually seeds attached to them. Some, some, some of those um, seed ferns have really, really, really big seeds. Um, and then they came up with the name seed fern because um, even though you know it's a seed plant and um, the foliage or the, the leaves look like ferns, um, it was initially very difficult to actually indicate to which particular groups they belonged. So this is an informal term that we still use for everything that is now extinct and has fern-like foliage and, and produces seeds. So in the Carboniferous, um, the nine orders that are recognized, and um, I'm just putting them here, it's not very important. Some of them um, are around for a very long time, um, up to the Jurassic or the Cretaceous. And I'm just showing some um, some material of these seed ferns on the right is a form called Allotopterus. The ones that I'm going to show is Medulosa. That's one of the most dominant ones in, in the swamps. So those Medulosans were large, scrubby trees. And if you ever see a reconstruction of them and you want to know if it's one of those, it's relatively easy because their, um, uh, their, their leaves uh, divide unequally. So very often they have a, um, yeah, a very different appearance than, for instance, a tree fern. So they had woody trunks with a, yeah, with a unique anatomy. Um, they, they had leaf bases surrounding uh, the vascular system, but on the inside of one of those leaf bases, you would find primary, uh, primary, um, yeah, the primary vascular system and a wedge of secondary uh, xylem or wood formed on the inside. So for people who looked at uh, module, module five, this was actually uh, the plant that Tom Phillips was looking at under the microscope. And to the left is what this looks like in a coal ball. People have done um, calculations by looking at the large cells of the wood, how fast the water could have been flowing through these plants. And, and they think that it actually functioned, uh, water transport speed functions similar to many uh, modern flowering plants. So this could have been a relatively fast growing plant. So the leaves are relatively large, um, up to seven meters. So that's really, really uh, impressive. And those leaves forked asymmetrically. And here you can you can see that that um, yeah, some parts are bigger, other ones are smaller. And um, yeah, this is an Allotopterus, and this is Neuropterus, or it's also called Neuropterus, and the stem is called medullosa. So these very, very large leaves, they're 
split in um, different branches with smaller leaflets. So they have relatively large cup-shaped pollen organs. And here you see some of those pollen, pollen organs. They're relatively big. And the pollen in those medullosan um, organs are relatively big. So if you look through the microscope at pollen assemblage, very often you won't even see them because they, they're relatively fragile. And a lot of people sieve their material before they look at uh, fossil pollen and spores through the microscope. Very often they're removed before the material ends up on a slide or is just destroyed. So people are still very curious why they produce such big pollen. They also have relatively large seeds that um, that appear on the, on, the, on the leaf margins. And some of them are up to, yeah, the size of a mango. So that's also pretty interesting. So now we're going over to um, another group. <clears throat> Those are the conifer relatives, the cordites. Um, they can have really, really large trap-like uh, leaves. So um, up to 70 centimeters long. So that's roughly uh, two foot. They can be very wide. And also here, when you see some of those leaves together, um, there's also almost uh, no mistake what you're looking at because nobody else was doing this. There are also some cordites with relatively small leaves. And when you find those, it's actually difficult to find out if you're looking at a conifer or if you're looking at a cordite. Cordites are often reconstructed as kind of mangrove-like plants. And we know that they were, some of them were at least living with their feet in, in the water. So they appeared at the beginning of the, the late Carboniferous and they became extinct at the end of the Permian when a big mass extinction happened. But the rest out of the conifers are of course still around. If you wanna know if your plant is a, that you find a stem that you find is a cordite or a conifer, problem is at that time, the conifers and the cordites had similar wood. You can split open the trunk, and if you're lucky, you can see a central cavity that is separated by kind of lamellae that we call septae, and um, then you know for sure it's actually a cordite. So that's very handy. So, uh, like conifers, cordates they produce cones, but the ones from cordites are relatively uh, small. They had pollen cones and female cones that almost looked the same. Uh, here you have a cordite shoot. Um, and yeah, this is what such a, um, yeah, these cones could look like. Um, if you produce um, the, the seed cones, um, a little tiny stem would come out with heart shape seeds attached and the pollen from the pollen cones would fertilize the, the seeds and then, or yeah. And from that new plants can grow. These seeds, finding them attached is relatively rare. They're mainly described from cobalts. So that's where cobalts made this connection again. So and here is an example of a picture where there is actually a seed attached to one of those cones that is uh, yeah, standing here in the axle of this bract. There's this little tiny axis going towards the seat, and there is another one. So this is a this is a pretty rare type of fossil. But we do see the seats a lot. And it's clear that they're yeah, cordate seat because it's hard shaped. So if you have See the leaves of the cordites in your material, in your assemblage, and you see these seeds, then it's pretty too easy to assume that you're dealing with cordites. So at the end of the Carboniferous, um, the peat swamp forest gradually started to disappear in Euro America. Here I'm looking, showing you a map from the late Carboniferous with the different biomes that were present on the earth at that time. 
and the dark green represents tropical everwet. And this is, of course, during the glacial intervals. So here we have the equator. Here we have Pangaea again. And this is Europe America. And here to the right is part of what is now China. Um, going from the late Carboniferous to the, into the Permian, the next period, um, Earth gradually warmed up and those peat swamp forests disappeared from Euro-America. They continued in China, so there they still have um, large uh, lycopods until the end of the Permian. And what happened near the equator is that it became tropical summer wet. So that's uh, the yellow color here in this diagram. Now you might think, hey, tropical summer wet, that sounds good. It's wet, right? Well, it's actually not. It just means that it's wet during the summer, but much drier during the rest of the year. So this is one of the reasons why the swamp plants those incredibly cool floras after being on our planet for more than 40, 50 million years. They disappeared from that region. As I said, they continue in China, but unfortunately disappeared at the end of the Permian during a big mass extinction. So we're um, yeah, almost ready to ask questions. This is um, a timeline with taxonomic representation of certain plants in floras going from 444 million years ago up to 2.6 million years ago. There are several names that you might recognize, the sostrophils, the lycopods, the progymnosperms um, that were dominant in the Devonian, the, the progymnosperms and the lycopods. During the Carboniferous, the seed ferns do really, really well. This is the Carboniferous, the lycopods do really well, the ferns and the big horsetails, and there are the cordites. Then by the Permian, planet starts to warm up and the spore producing plants like the lycopods start to peter out and it's almost as if they disappear. It's this dark green line that continues but you don't find a lot of them in the floras anymore so in this diagram it looks as if they disappear but they actually don't. Lycopodium, Selaginella, and Isoetis are extant lycopods. And one of my favorite plants is Isoetis. Um, and this is what they look like. Um, they are the only plants that is left from that, that, that lineage that included those arborescent big, big trees with secondary uh, wood, um, the big lycopods. And if you would go cut open an, an Isoetis, they it's a quill work. They live in in uh, in oligotrophic points, ponds, so nutrient poor ponds. And you would still see that they produce a little tiny bit of wood, but they're very, very small and relatively rare. But they do have some in Marin County if you want to see them. Okay, so take home points from module six. The Carboniferous peat swamps were dominated by entirely different plant groups compared to modern ecosystems, but lycopods, horsetails, ferns, and seed plants were co-equal components. And the peat swamps unfortunately disappeared in Euro America when our planet started to warm up and flip out of the ice ages. And several of these plant groups, with the exception of the um, uh, the seed ferns still persist today. Um, lycopods and horsetails are one of them, but they're all much smaller in stature. I can now take questions.